Hi folks and welcome to the Battle Fever podcast and in particular obviously the, the Euro Review which is now episode 2 um, We've actually had a bit of football to watch or a bit of football maybe to hide behind our sofa as we watch it um, depending on whether you follow the national team or not Joining me this week again we've got Derek Clark, um, Patrick Caskey, we've got Gio um, who is the man behind the few tea cards and also we have Callum back with us as well. Um, how are we doing, team? We all right? Hi. Hi, we're all right. I was at work when we saw and played, so I didn't have to watch it, so I'm all right. You <laughs> lucky bastard. <laughs> what <are> you? <laughs> uh, Patrick, how are we doing, mate? Yeah, good. It's nice to have the football on, and it was interesting today and yesterday to see all the Champions League draws kind of wetting the appetite for. Um, further down in the summer but interestingly UEFA have banned all away fans so there will be no official Rangers traveling parties to wherever they go but I think we'll all we will all see some guys with Union Jacks in wherever it is <laughs> we're all over the world anyway so it doesn't matter you're official <laughs> official <laughs> yeah. I'm sure there'll be Rangers supporters who find their way into these places yeah. that's just the way they are um, obviously the, the Euros have begun We've now seen every single team in action. We're recording this on Wednesday. This goes out Friday. So obviously today's matches like Wales, um, Italy, you know, people like that, we won't be able to comment on. And obviously tomorrow's games um, and then the big one on Friday, if you like. Going back to... Oh, obviously, Derek, you've got the Italy top on the day. It's a better in Italy shirt, actually. But going back to, to Italy starting the, the tournament... Oh, it's a, it's a smasher, mate. It's an absolute smasher. Uh, a comfortable <laughs> victory over Turkey. Now, is it that the Turks didn't really show up to the opening game? Or was it that Italy were just that good? I think it was a bit of both, uh, I think, Scott. Now, I was speaking to a pal of mine who, uh, surprisingly to me, he knew everything about Turkey, their star players. He actually put money on them. They were 50 to 1 each way. He stuck money on He was like, you need to get money on this team. They're... they're, 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 they're on a, a really good run of form, they're second to France in the, the World Cup qualifying and all that. And I was expecting big things for them on, on what was it, Friday night? And they were, I wouldn't say they were hopeless, but they, they set up to just contain Italy. They never really offered much going forward. And I was really disappointed in them, to be honest with you. I think it was only a matter of time before Italy scored. Uh, when they did do that, the, the sort of floodgates opened a little bit for them. And they looked pretty impressive for, for, for me, Italy. I think it, it's important in these tournaments that you grow into the the tournament, you don't want to blow a gasket straight away, but I think Italy controlled the game. Um, didn't exert too much energy. I think they put gears to go up, and I'm really hoping that Turkey, uh, well, say hoping, I'd really like to see them do a bit better because I think they came in here uh, with an expectation to do well, and they, they flattered to deceive. Patrick, is it that they will maybe find out a wee bit more about Turkey after today's um, game against Wales, basically? Obviously, the viewers will... And the listeners will know the result of this by the time this goes out. So it could be that we'll, we'll cover both angles here. That the Welsh did well and they're probably through. Or the Welsh are now maybe looking at the exit in the tournament. But in terms of Turkey, you were obviously talking about them as well. That you, you wanted them to do well. Yeah, I mean, obviously it's not played in Istanbul, but it's played in Baku. The stadium is terrible. And there's a real disconnect between the fans on the pitch and the an actual pitch. There's always the joke that you need binoculars when you're there, but I think there are supposed to be 30,000 people in the stadium because uh, Turkey and Azerbaijan share a border. They're really close. So it will be almost as close to home game as they can get. And I think they should set up different, uh, differently because if the Scottish media and the sort of culture around football is sort of toxic, it's probably 10 times worse in Turkey. So they'll t- change completely everything. Um, you'll see probably... The listeners will probably know Cengiz Under. He was at Leicester this season. He was subbed on in the second half and he offered a bit of pace. And he got Turkey's only shot on target. So he'll probably start from the onset. But Wales, I only caught the second half of it. But they seemed, the scoreline seemed to flatter them quite a bit. I think their keeper Ward did really well to keep them in the game uh, and at 1 1. But I think we should see Turkey play a bit better. But I mean, Wales have set up to be quite dogged and uh, active on the counter attack. So I really don't want to say any score prediction because, uh, as we've seen, uh, a lot of upsets can happen so far. 
Geo, have you? It's Patty Slinky there, the, the, the Turkish Steve Clark. Then it would seem. Um, <laughs> are we? Are we impressed with Turkey? Were we, we obviously we're expecting a wee bit more from them. Their record has been good going into the tournament. It might just have been they come up against an Italian side that's just going to go far in the tournament. I think picking up on even what Derek said about, you know, I think we were all expecting a wee bit more from them. And I don't know if that was because the Italians were so good. But, I mean, if you if you actually look at the Turkish squad, they may not be household names to a lot of people. But, I mean, there's a lot of guys there who play in Syria. Ah, so I sort of expected quite a cagey game and a bit of closeness as well. Um, and I think because we hear in the media quite a lot about the money that's branded around from the big Turkish teams, we always naturally assume that they're going to be a very, very good standard, which they probably are, but even even sorry, picking up on, on, on a bit of a Rangers theme as well, when Rangers played Galatasaray at the beginning of the qualifiers, um, way at the beginning of the season, I, I thought Rangers outplayed them um, for large spells of the game. So bringing it back from that, I did expect a wee bit more, but I wasn't surprised to see Italy doing so well. And obviously the reports coming that M- Mancini's got them playing a really good, sexy brand of football was nice to see as well, because I think we're all used to seeing the Italian teams being that dogged, sort of, they'll stick in, they'll get the 1-0, you know, the arsenal of old almost, you know what I mean? Um, mm-hmm. But it was nice to see them coming out and showing a bit of flair in that second half. So it was uh, it was a good intro, it was a good, really good opening for it. Carl, Italy, well, I think Mancini already wins best dressed at the tournament award anyway, because, you know, the, he just looked, he did, he looked smart, but right, there's no getting away from it. The man is a, a fucking genius, right? Um, we know his teams, we've seen him at City, we've seen him at Inter, we've played against him as Rangers um, when, when he was Inter manager. How, how do we think, to, to, to borrow Clive Tildesley's phrase from the whole, uh, from the france Germany game, the Italians when they pack their bags, they day pack their bags for a month, let's face it, they don't pack their bags like us for two or three days in the tournament and then chuck it. So how far do we see Italy going? Well, I actually underestimated Italy and I overestimated Turkey because I'm a big fan of Turkey. I think they've got a, a good couple of players. You know, Okai Yakusli was playing in the Premier League this season, but Gilmaz has had a really good season. But the thing about Italy is I thought because they're going through this bit of a sort of transitional period that it might take a few games or even a few months to bed in. But they look like a team who've been playing together for years and years. Obviously, that, that the back two of Benucci and Cialini have been playing together for ages. But you've got the likes of um, Spinazzola and Locatelli and uh, the boy who came off the bench, which is named Chiesa, who don't have that many caps to their name. So I expected a lot less from them. Um, but I, I could see them as, you couldn't really call them a dark horse after a performance like that. But I, I can see them going quite far. And Spinazzola as well is, is a right-footed player playing at left back, isn't he? And that's quite unusual to see, you know, cutting back inside and... Obviously, I mean, it's the, it's the usual. It's, it's when you go to, and we'll get to the Holland game, but it's we, like Jan Malenko when he cuts inside and he's left. Why are you not showing him doing to the corner flag? You know what I mean? It's the right hand side. I suppose teams might get wise to that when they're playing Italy as well. Um, but no, I thought the Italians were really, really good. Um, I thought that they never really gave Turkey a chance to play. They never really gave Turkey a chance to come out, to be quite honest with you. Um, and moving on, we, we can I hear Matt some games and I think. We have to mention the Holland um Ukraine game because that was the one where we thought we were going to see the come well, we did see a comeback of some sorts and then you wouldn't have betted against Ukraine going and winning it, but ultimately uh, Holland a great goal for what a name eh? Denzel Dumfries. <laughs> what a fucking name that is. Uh, what a header into the corner and wins the game. But Patrick, picking up on what I was saying, Jan Malenko, you can't show him in the left-hand side like on his left foot. You know what I mean? He's lethal. He showed it time and time again. Yeah, I mean, you think the Dutch would know the best. I mean, they had Robin in their midst for over a decade, and that's sort of the prototypical cutting from the right and shoot with the left. But no, it was uh, the first half. I mean, the Netherlands were all over it, and really Ukraine only clicked in the last, what, 20 minutes? Um, but an interesting thing on the construction of the Ukraine squad, it was quite encouraging from... Uh, our own viewpoint to see uh, Dinamo Kiev have six starters in a, such a high quality national team, thinking perhaps to the future of what Rangers can do in fuel the Scotch national team. But um, they were good to watch. I enjoyed the flickiness of their play. They loved uh, playing the ball around the corner, back flicks. Roman Yuremchuk probably was the best at that. Um, just a really, really tricky striker who made the game fun to watch. I like that. Pep had 
Tiki Taka, we've got Patrick with flickiness. I like that. Get get you involved with Stevie G this year. Get that in there. <laughs> uh, Derry, would you make a Holland, mate? I enjoyed watching them. I, I, I didn't have uh, that high uh, sort of ambitions for them after that draw with Scotland. I think they were they were pretty pretty poor, to be honest with you. Um, but I was impressed by them. They, they look like they're going to entertain in this competition. I like Memphis Depay. I know he's a bit flamboyant off the field, and um, but on, on I, th- I felt he was a, he, he, he's one of those players you off your skinny. So um, I enjoyed watching them. I don't know how far they'll go. I think they'll they'll get out the group, but um, I'm not too sure if if, if they've got uh, designs on on winning the competition. But yeah, I enjoyed the game the other night there. Ukraine as well. Um, fair play to them coming for, for two goals down. I think with Shevchenko as the manager as well, you're, you're you're expecting some sort of entertainment as well. So um, those two, I think, can, can can go far in the competition. I don't think they'll win it, of course, but yeah, it was a cracking game. Best game of the, the tournament so far, easily. I think as well with Holland, Gio, is they're probably are going to be the ones to watch um, as they progress through it because defensively, they are not great, to be honest with you. They, they remind me... No, they don't remind me a lot of Rangers because defensively they're not great because obviously defensively they're pretty good. But in terms of how high their fullbacks are, they are basically like two attacking players. You know, it's like watching Tav and Barisic, but slightly less quality. Um, <laughs> go, you know, pushing forward. So, I think with them being kind of shaky at the back, they're missing Van Dyke, obviously. Uh, and also, quite clinical going forward. And, and Derek's saying about Depay there... Depay never really showed as much in, in the in the Ukraine game as what he did even against Scotland. So I think he's got levels to go up, but I think they're going to be the side that'll entertain. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, D- I believe Depay is very close to sending for Barcelona. Um, and I know they've obviously a Dutch connection there with Koeman again, and he's trying to recruit and bring back that Dutch sort of Cruyff, you know, record sort of feed to the club again. But yeah, again, picking up on what you said about the fullbacks, I, I was really impressed with uh, with Dumfries. I thought it, it was two or three occasions before that where he came very, very close as well. Yeah. Um, I know Could have had a hat trick, mate. Yeah, yeah. And I, but they play three at the back. Um, but obviously, it, it's something that, I, you know, again, is, is that more sort of continental European style that allowed their fullbacks to get forward, I think, you know, um, but. Yeah, moving forward, I like I like the big man Veghorst as well. I was quite impressed with him. I know he scored a lot of goals in Germany, and and again, for you know archetypal, you know sort of great touch for a big man, you know almost that Peter Crouch type thing. But he was very good as well. Yeah, they're they're reasonably solid. Um, would they go far? I would like to see it because again, again, we all have that sort of semi Dutch connection and things like that, and we've always enjoyed their brand of football throughout the years, but. Again, I think for them, if they get to the quarters, maybe even the semis, it, it, it's a really good tournament for them. I think, Callum, they miss Ronald De Boer. I think they miss Fernando Rickson. I think they miss Bert Conneman. <laughs> Michael Bowles. <laughs> Do we need to go on? Our Dutch connection at club level, obviously, is huge. And it's a, it's a national team that I always like to, to look at and, and you know hope they do well. Um, I think they flew... A plane over their training base. Am I right? The uh, the Dutch fans and said four three three because that is the Dutch style and that is their formation. Let's face it. As Geo says, Calm they set up with kind of three at the back with the two wing backs. I suppose the board leaves himself open to criticism big time. You know, you can't obviously always go with the fans say, but he, he does leave himself open a wee bit. Yeah, they do like that formation there, um, and sometimes that's been a bit of a. A downfall with Barcelona. You see that they're trying to get this Netherlands or this Dutch connection back, and you kind of just play a formation because it's the club ethos. I don't think that really works. Um, they've tried the the four three three quite a lot, and it just doesn't suit the players that they have. And so it took a brave move by Coman to change to like a sort of three five two at times or a four four two. Um, but I did. I was really impressed, and there was two two players in this game that I. Um, if we go way back to the the time where we were scouting players for Rangers, um, there was two players that I, I mentioned. One was Denzel Dumfries, who's been a big player for years, and the other was Jaramchuk, and I was really impressed with him. So, it's you know, the Netherlands are certainly the, the higher quality team, but I, I'll be keeping an eye on Ukraine because I was impressed by them. Shevchenko as well, it feels, it feels weird seeing him as the manager now. Mm. Um, of the team, you know, you, you, you're so you grown up and so you know, they'll all be the same. So used to watching Shevchenko at that 
you know, I mean, the tournament, been leading the line for Ukraine and and being the superstar that he was as a player. Um, I must admit, I feared for him a wee bit when when he went two down. I thought, oh no, this could this could turn nasty on them, you know, with the way the Dutch were playing. But credit to him sticking to it, and and obviously he lost. I mean, he had to substitute. He had to make a substitution early doors then due to an injury. So obviously his plans are kind of thrown away a wee bit there. But we we'll have to mention the commentary team in that game as well. Our own Clive Tildesley and Super Ali McCoist. And as I said on Twitter last night, FIFA 22 should be making them their commentary team going forward. And I've just found out that they, they are not going to be the commentary team for the England-Scotland game, which is terrible in, in behalf of ITV. It's just that's a shocking decision. Um, you've got the balance there of Clive being English and, and Ali being Scottish. And that's what, we sh- what they should have went me. But I suppose... ITV know better than me, don't they? But anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> moving yeah. to any other any other countries there that kind of have kind of impressed or that have caught your eye or. Um, I, 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 I know I know it was uh, uh, sad circumstances, but Finland getting that first win was um, yeah. was something else. Uh, of course, we've got an interest with uh, Glenn Kamara. I thought he did well. Um, I think they're a team that they just remind me of Iceland a, a few years ago when they uh, they impressed. Um, they've got that work ethic about them; they're hard to beat, uh, and en- enjoyed uh, enjoy watching them. So um, I think they can they can uh, progress again, maybe quarter final something like that. But they're going to give uh, other nations problems because they work so hard. So um, they they stood out for me. I would have to say. Um, the Czechs, I know we're going to touch on this, Scott, with uh, the Scotland game, but the, the Czechs, I didn't really have, to be honest, I didn't really know much about them But before they came to the tournament. I'm not too sure if you can read a victory over Scotland into that too much, um, based on the, the, the sort of calamity that, that we were. But, um, yeah, they, they were impressive. The boys, Schick, of course, scored the, the worldie. So um, they're, a, they're a team that, that could cause problems to, to England and Croatia. Yeah, definitely. And also, we should touch on the tragic circumstances in uh, Christian Eriksen. Um, and I'm glad to see, or I'm glad to hear that Christian Eriksen is, you know, responding and, and is making jokes and is talking to his teammates and things like that. I think it, the the first aiders on show that night should be praised uh, to Ray Evans for their quick response, the referee for his quick response and. And understanding the, the seriousness and also the Danish captain as well. Um, and then the full Danish squad for getting rid of and offering a bit of privacy while TV cameras for some absolute unbelievable reason that I'll never understand were still rolling, showing a man there receiving CPR and, and getting defibs involved and I just don't understand that at all. Um, so our thoughts are with Christian Eriksen and his family and hopefully makes a speedy recovery and who knows if he'll be able to go back playing again. You look at Daley Blunt, who's obviously back playing again after similar you know, troubles, and then you look at guys like Fabrice Muamba, who obviously has had to retire through it, and in Scotland we, we, we had Phil Adorno, remember, that um, sadly passed away. So, you know, it's, it's got to be, I suppose, whatever's best for Christian Eriksen's long-term health has to come into that there, and maybe the decision will need to be taken out of his hands a wee bit, you know, so, mm. um, but speedy recovery and hopefully he's, he's back um, to full health soon. I think before we get to Scotland, we should probably touch on France, Germany last night. The two real heavyweights that I've met so far in the tournament. Um, Callum, Ger- Germany coming into it. He's jockey love and that, he's announcing he's, he's leaving. Um, you know, Flick's taking over. It's it was always going to be a kind of t- a tough tournament, I suppose, for them. Um, but you can't you can't write off the Germans as such. They are, you know, Voxsprung duck technique, as they say. It's German efficiency. Yeah, absolutely. And if you look at that German team, there's still a lot of heavyweights of German football, and there's the, the kind of newcomers who've exploded in the last few years. Robin Gossens is one of the one of my favourite players. But I just I really fancy this this France team again. I think that to a man, they're almost all the highest quality of player that you can be. I like their their back line. I think Benjamin Pavard is one of the most versatile defenders that I'm watching just now. He can play it right back and he can play so comfortably at centre back and he can you see him go further up. Golo Kante doesn't need much and Benzema's had a, a big resurgence in the last few years. Um 
So it was it was France that I was keeping an eye on alongside Belgium. Those are the two teams that I really wanted to watch. Um, you can never discount Germany, but sometimes the quality that France have, especially along with their their pace, is just it's frightening at times. It's, the thing is, as well, is you've got Kimmich there who's playing as right wing back, Patrick, when he's played centre midfield or certainly in the midfield for Bayern. So, you know, is there a way, is there a thing that that kind of, I suppose, accommodating Gunnigan and um, Tony Cruz really rather than, than maybe playing the players that are in form and in their correct positions? Uh, I think uh, probably the German squad is the epitome of shoehorning at this World Cup. I mean, Nabry is playing striker as well. Um, you kind of have to play as where you see fit. I think form is often over emphasize in terms of in the national team because you're playing for a different team albeit if you if you score 30 goals as a striker you want to be starting but uh, it's a different dynamic it's even though it's the same game the nature of international football is quite different but i think it, it was it was a good game um i don't i don't think it much should be read into either team i think germany probably did better than most were expecting at least certainly what i expected i so, sort of thought france would roll them over but the one nil was probably fair i think uh, the most talk was probably about Paul Pogba. He was really impressive. Or also the weird incident that happened with Rudiger biting Pogba, and which was just weird. But no, Pogba was... I mean, maybe it's because we're in the UK and it's always an Anglo-centric sort of uh, focus, but I thought Pogba was really impressive. Um, it's sort of just a marriage of circumstance where he plays best with those around him and France can provide him with the necessary... Uh, cover, whereas Man United seemingly can't. Yeah, I think that's a, a huge point there, Derek, is that, you know, in, in the Man United team, he's, he's not playing with Kante, do you know what I mean? He's not playing with guys like that next to him. I know Bruno Fernandes and that's a great player, but he's, he's not playing with people who can allow maybe Paul to go and express himself as much. Yeah, I was having a chat with this with a boy I know last night and we're thinking, maybe Brett, maybe English football just doesn't suit him. Maybe he's, he's used to it, uh, played in Italy or or Germany or Spain, where he gets more time in the ball, and that may be the the reason why he's he's, he's much more impressive for France on the eye than he is for, for Man United. So yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those that I'm sure Ole Gunnar Solskjaer will be hoping to, to rectify um, if if he stays at the club. But yeah, France are a joy to watch, and they've got gears to go through for me. They were, they were brilliant last night. Mbappe's goal that wasn't a goal was was unreal. How he managed to, to bend it in, the speed of him is is, is frightening. Um, the Germans, on the other hand, uh, they were disappointing last night, weren't they? In the main, especially being playing what in effect is a home game for them. So I still expect them to go through and uh, don't rule them out. The, the, the Germans, uh, they're always in the there or thereabouts, you know what I mean? So I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't totally discount them at, at this stage. But France, for me, are the team to beat. France just look um, as though they can go up the gears, Geo, and really put in what they need to put in to win games to get through uh, and ultimately, let's face it, they probably will unless there's a disaster like they implode from within, which mm. by the way can happen with the French, let's face it, it's happened before. Um, you see the issues already with Mbappe and um, Giroud. So, but uh, going by ability alone and taking all that aside, the French have to win it, don't they? Yeah, they, they just, they looked so good last night. Um, I was really impressed with the, the work rate of, of, the, of the players you probably wouldn't usually associate with high work rate, the likes of Antoine Griezmann, um, really putting in a massive, massive shift um, on, on the left-hand side. And and obviously, you, you know, the fans' favourite, everyone's favourite, Kante, was just sublime last night. It, you know, um, he was just so good. He was so good. And he just does the simple things so well. But Germany looked a wee bit toothless last night. Um, it was hard to say, like like Patrick said, they had Gnabry playing up front, where for Barney usually plays in that more withdrawn, sort of bursting through sort of role, and they just didn't. In the second half, they got it together a wee bit, and I was a wee bit disappointed in Germany. I thought we would have had a wee bit more of a two heavyweight type of tussles going at each other and back and forth, but again, the, the French just look so good. And Mbappe, I mean, there was a, there was a, I think he gave. Matt Hummels at uh, 30 yards and he literally caught him and went past him and it was it was it was like schoolboy stuff but you know it was like men playing against kids it was it was frightening but yeah it was a, it was a good game um 
it was just so good to have an, another big game on and, and it, it just whets the appetite for more to come forward but i'm really looking forward to, to like derek said for the for the french to just start picking up and going through the gears a wee bit i think by the time the the tournament comes to its peak we're going to see something really special from them i suppose that was a game as well where you had um you know you you'd uh players that we've we've watched over the years come back, you know, and play for the national team. So Muller, for instance, Hummels, for instance, um, you also had Karim Benzema there as well. Um, it kind of makes you wonder at Scotland a wee bit, thinking Alan McGregor, do you know what I mean? <laughs> could he could he have came back? <laughs> I know that I would have wanted him to come back. I think Alan McGregor deserved a rest for a selfish Rangers point of view. But it was good to see players like that back, you know, players who can still offer something for their country, I suppose. Um, and it kind of makes you wonder at our side, you know. Scott, Scott mind, um, mind uh, Scott Brown retired and, and we went out of our way to get him back into the team for the, was it the England game? Yeah. So Steve Clark should have went cap in hand, begging, done whatever it takes to get him back between the sticks because I can bet you everything that I own, that that goal, that second check goal wouldn't have happened if McGregor was singles. Right, before we get to that <laughs> that debacle, obviously our podcast sponsored by G4 Claims this year. So, Imagine a world with no cold calling. A world where companies don't sell your data to other companies who want to pester you. At G4 Claims, we don't cold call and we don't buy a single lead from data companies. Oh, and if you're due any compensation from your car accident, you pay nothing to us at all. For full accident management support, including motor replacement, repairs and personal injury compensation claims, just search G4 Claims today for help the way you want it. Right, so Scotland. (laughs) We We all sat last week and we all said about how... It was hard, whether you like the national team or not, whether you follow the national team or no, I challenge MD who doesn't have any, you know, who has a small ounce of pride in, in the fact that they're Scottish, not to get swept away a wee bit in the build up, especially on Monday. You know, the first one in 23 years. Um, we're at home, we're, you're, you're up against the, the team who you would. Who you would say we have the chance of, of beating here, really, if we're looking at it realistically on paper. The team comes out, and Patrick, I'm coming to you here because we messaged, we had a wee kind of message about this earlier. The team comes out, and I believe a nation is deflated in one team lineup, right? Now, if we're deflated, can you imagine the players, right? And Steve Clark did say these guys done well in Serbia, well, that was last year. Players form dips, you know. You only need to look at Ryan Christie, who's been decent for Celtic in the past. However, he's not been great this year. Yet he finds himself in the starting lineup ahead of maybe others who should be there. Your thoughts on that? Um, well, the Rangers focus thing is, I didn't expect Patterson or McLaughlin to start. Uh, I would have wanted them, obviously. McLaughlin probably has less of a case because. Obviously, Marshall's uh, reputation precedes him, and he, for whatever reason, he has done all right. And O'Donnell, I don't think should be anywhere near the squad, but I expect him to start as well, just because um, obviously loyalty is placed perhaps at the highest perch in Clark's setup. And you can make the argument that perhaps Patterson is physically uh, not mature enough; he's not big enough to um, compete at the top level. But then you only need to look at the examples of him competing. Uh, in the Europa League and in the Premiership this season. But uh, beyond that, I think not starting Adams was probably the overall most scandalous decision um, when you take your blue glasses off. I think he showed an injection of creativity, pace, and just a general upturn in form for the team in the second half. Because the what between the 45th and the 55th minutes, Holm were dominating. Um, you can make no qualms about it. But besides that, um, I think McTominay was poor but the uh, people sort of failed to perform I think Turnbull should have come on Gilmore should have come on but uh, I was surprised Christie got hooked to half time I thought he was definitely better than Armstrong but um, I think it was just a calamity of errors which ultimately lays at the feet of the manager more so than anyone else because Marshall obviously has the one glaring um, error but beyond that he put in a decent shift 
Uh, Jack Hendry has um, a brain fart and shoots, but he did hit the crossbar what ten minutes ago, and he did score against Holland the week prior. So you can't really blame him for shooting, and you can make the case that O'Donnell's so so back that Hendry isn't offered the ball to the right to cross it in. So he's either forced to throw in a random ball into the box or shoot. So he's kind of given a few options, but uh, yeah, it was it wasn't great. On that, right, let me let me read what Steve Clark has said in the press t- today, right, which if you're a Scotland fan who agrees with Patrick there, particularly on Stephen O'Donnell, you pff, probably turn off the new. Analyse the game and tell me what Stephen <laughs> did wrong, Clark said. How many chances came off that side? Jakub Yankto, one of their most dangerous players, had a quiet game. The left-back, a really good attacking left-back, Jan Burrell, didn't uh, create a chance in the game. So analyse the game before we start killing players just because of who they are and where they play. Analyse his games when he plays for us. Look at his performances objectively. Just look at the games. Stephen's first job is to be a defender. So analyse the games. That's all I'll say on that one. Now, already you can hear people going, you're a fucking clown, (laughs) right? So... Derek, <laughs> we're not going to call him a clown, well, we are going to call him a clown, right? Because that's what the guy is, in my opinion. Um, Patrick makes a, makes an excellent point, which I made earlier, and I've not really heard a lot of people say it, right? I, I was talking to my dad earlier about the, about the game. Stephen O'Donnell is that deep that when Jack Hendry goes to take that shot, had Nathan Parson been in there, I think Nathan Parson is, is practically on the edge of the box, you know what I mean? Um, out on the right hand side and I think it maybe it makes it a wee bit easier for Jack Hendry to pass it no excusing the fact that Jack Hendry's took that shot on but as Patrick says his confidence is high after his goal he's also just struck the bar with a good strike I can see why he's took the shot on not that I, I think it was a good idea but I understand it right before we even get to the goalkeeping position and, and where David Marshall is because as I said in Twitter he's in fucking Tory Glen Asda right so I don't know why he's there but Stephen O'Donnell is that deep that it's no help in the situation. No, and I don't want to go on the, the Stephen O'Donnell bashing brigade because he's, he's, he's a target at the end of the day. He gives his all, you know what I mean? But he's an honest trier. But at the end of the day, he plays for Motherwell. He's a, they're a bottom six club and he looks like that on the international stage. This is, Europe, this is the Euros, you know what I mean? And... He's been found out. I was watching them. I know what Clark says. He, um, he was defending them there, but let's be honest. His first touch in that that uh, first half was a tackle. He backheeled one out of play. He went and tackled Ryan Christie, ran into him in the box, and he should have closed down the boy that get the, the cross in for the the first goal. Just he's 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 not good enough for this level. He shouldn't be on that that in that environment. Um, I mentioned earlier, he wouldn't get in the Rangers squad, so that there's your answer. Nathan Patterson should be given the opportunity. Um, he, he can handle big occasions. He would relish playing on an occasion like that. He would absolutely relish playing at Wembley. And I'd rather he go up against the likes of Sterling and uh, Foden and, and whatever England choose to uh, choose to play on Friday night than, than <laughs> Stephen O'Donnell. I mean, it, it, I, I'm actually thinking to that game, thinking we're going to have him going up against these guys. It just it beggars belief. Um, the, the goal, the second goal itself, I wouldn't blame Marshall uh, uh, entirely for that. I, I like David Marshall when when he was at Wigan the season before last. He was brilliant. He was pulling off all sorts of saves. His, his form, of course, is slightly dipped for, for Derby uh, and not playing as much last season. Um, but in the main, he's, he's a decent goalkeeper. There is calls, of course, for, for Craig Gordon to get the knob, which I would understand as well. Um, John McLaughlin, I think we've got the, the blue tinted specs on to want him to play. But again, I think he wouldn't let you down. I think he's a, a very dependable goalkeeper. Um, so they have got a rare goalie there, but you just worry that David Marshall, that might affect him, that, that, that goal, because it was absolute comedy at the end of the day. I mean, that's what everyone's going to be talking about. It's a good strike, but it's, it's the, we've all seen the memes and what have you, um, and it's something he's going to have to, have to have to live with. It's so Scotland, isn't it, to lose a, a goal like that? But in terms of team selection, yeah, I think Clark got it wrong. I don't think Jack Hendry should be in the team either. I don't think he's... Of course, we missed Kieran Tierney on, on Monday. I don't think Hendry would have played if, if Tierney was fit, but um, it's just it's all about quality at the end of the day. Patrick mentioned McTominay. I agree, he wasn't at his best. Um, I think he'd, he'd, he'd be one of the first to own up to that, but 
I think for Friday he has got to change it up. If he goes with the, the same sort of same side, I think we could be in trouble. Callum, the the problem that I think Clark has is that okay, guys like O'Donnell will steal the headlines. Um, David Marshall's positioning for that second goal will steal the headlines. What I believe his problem is, and it probably sums up, it sums that up with you two players, is that Steve Clark is loyal to so many that form becomes an irrelevance, right? Now I've already made the point that if if Celtic are obviously screaming out for a right back, and if if um, Stephen O'Donnell was of any decent standard. He would have been signed on a free for Celtic last year. He wasn't. He went to Motherwell, and I think that speaks volumes, right? David Marshall done a job for Steve Clark. He got the country to the finals. However, as Derek says, his form has slightly dipped, right? Derby were almost relegated. He's been in and out the team. The, that isn't the David Marshall of when we played Serbia. Right, so for me, you pick the players at the minute who are in form and you go with them. Now, the, the, the argument can be made for Craig Gordon, given the fact he's a, an excellent goalkeeper, probably shouldn't have left Celtic, in hindsight, when you think of it now and who they signed to replace him. And also, John McLaughlin is only no playing every week because he has Alan McGregor in front of him, which, by the way, is no shame. Right? To me, out of the three goalkeepers, and whether I keep blue-tinted specs on or take blue-tinted specs off, John McLaughlin is the best goalkeeper out of the three, right? The only, the only argument you make for him not getting into that team is he's not playing every week, right? That's the only argument that can be made for that. So, we'll, we'll get to those teams later for Friday, right? But, is he loyal to too many players who are probably known for now, Cal? Right, so this is the only reason I'm here to speak about this game. So give me a second, because <laughs> I'm going to come up with some some bad shouts. But um, I I do think I I'm actually quite a quite a fan of David Marshall because I thought he he was really good the last time, and I think that there's a bit of a paradox if you're speaking about let's not be too loyal to players, let's play players who are on form, but then you say John McLaughlin isn't playing very often, so how are you getting a consistent basis of his form? I think um, I think David Marshall's harsh done by by one one error, which is a very big 40-yard error, but I, I think if you actually look back at the game, he made some decent saves, and I, I wouldn't be, when I'm looking at the team on Friday, if, if Marshall's the first name on the team sheet, that's not the first thing I'm going to be looking at. It's not the it's not the thing that's gonna that's gonna bother me. I do think his loyalty to some players is um, is a bit blinding because Stephen O'Donnell is a bit pish for me. I don't like Stephen O'Donnell. He's um, the cut broadfoot, mate. That's what he is. He's, he is. He's, does a job, but at this point, I say I, I think you you have to have solid, you know, loyal and and good players in every club side. But we're now in the national team. In a Euro, a European competition, I think that being, you know, good and a good servant only gets you so far. I would rather just have a better footballer. Uh, I think Nathan Parson is. That's the that's the one big one for me that I'd like to see. I think you, there's it's so easy to to write off Nathan Parson because he's so young, he's so inexperienced, but he's also matured at a rate that you don't see many 17, 18 year olds or 19, whatever he is now, progress in such a, a short space of time. He made a big mistake and in my in my memory to to mind, the Antwerp game is the best I've seen him play. As soon as he came back on, he, he was fantastic. He scored the goal. Um and I think if you were if you were to give him a chance, yes that goal probably wouldn't have happened. Um I don't actually blame David Marshall too much for Jack Hendry's decision to shoot because I also don't like Jack Hendry very much. <laughs> um, but I think Nathan Parson has to be in there. And the Jack Hendry one, before we move on to our teams or whatever, that's another one I want to speak about. No one's actually mentioned Lyndon Dykes yet, who I don't like either, sorry to say. Um, I saw about Could have sent for us, mate. I didn't know, did he? <laughs> <laughs> Thank fuck. That's fucking Glasgow Rangers, the Queen's Park Rangers. There's a big difference there. Yeah. 
the the chances that Dykes passed up in that game, I thought I thought were criminal. There was a, a really early chance in which Robbo crossed in the ball. I think Dykes hit it near post. It was a, a good save from Vash, like they were saying. He should have scored. There was another one that Andy Robertson missed after he was fed in by McGinn. But the um, the real one was when Vashlik made the save with his feet. And I think you really you really need to be scoring that. It doesn't matter who you are. So Lyndon Dykes disappointed me as well. And the Jack Henry thing I wanted to touch on was if you actually go back and look at the the decision to shoot from so from so far, you can you can blame Stephen O'Donnell, you can blame David Marshall, Stephen O'Donnell for not being there. But I think there was um I've actually written it down. So he was surrounded by around three players, Jack Henry, and there was a further five players on top of the three that was between Henry and the goal that he was shooting at. As soon as he turns over possession, a counter attack's going to happen. Do you know? So I just thought that the decision was a poor one, and I wasn't happy with that. So Jack Henry, spoiler, is not going to be in my team for Friday. There's no one in mine either, mate, to be fair. So. Um, Gio, he's, in every, he's in nobody's but probably Steve Clark. Steve Clark's. Uh, Gio, from a non Scottish perspective, right? You, you've got to take your hat off for the quality in the boys' finish, right? And Schick's finish. But again, I go back to Rangers, right? And and we obviously experienced Kamar Roof hitting one for his own half and it going in this year in Belgium. We wax lyrical about the quality in that goal. It is. But really, if that's happening against us, I'll always question the goalkeeper. Mm. Right? It doesn't matter how good the goalkeeper is. Even if it's Alan McGregor, I will still be questioning Alan McGregor getting beat for that distance. That won't change now with David Marshall and the thing. As much as you take your hat off to the boy for trying it, he stated himself, I've seen him off his line a couple of times, and I thought... I'm going to try it. That to me speaks volumes, and he must take his share in the he, he's, he's share of the blame in the goal. Yeah, it, you know, on one hand, we we are talking about. I mean, Schick is what forty million quid he went for recently. You know, he's a, he's a and I've watched him when he was playing in Italy a wee bit, and he's a, he's a he's a he's a very good player. You know, again, he's not your he's not your typical big man sort of player. Um, so yeah, I, I, I totally again. You know, it, it's hard to pinpoint. I don't think there was anybody for the Scotland team really stood out. Um, what, what's a wee bit more disturbing for me is is the likes of Billy Gilmore not getting a run, and I think that's a feeling of of a lot of a lot of the Scottish teams. We have, I say we. I think there, there's been a there's a reluctance to put in small players. You know, if you're not six foot two and you can run through brick walls. Then you're not very good, and you're not going to get in the Scotland team. We're talking about Billy Gilmore here as a kid who, in his very first start for Chelsea against Liverpool, won Man of the Match. He then has proceeded to. Let's be honest, the only person keeping him out of that that Chelsea team at the minute is probably Kante. Um, you know who is probably one of the best players in that position in the world. So I, I think the the exclusion of Gilmore really hit home for me. Obviously with Patterson, you know, again. You know, O'Donnell is probably a really nice guy. He's probably a really good guy. Sort of continually bash him is, is, is harsh on the man. But, you know, again, Clark defending him and saying that, oh, but look at nothing came down the right hand side and this didn't happen and that didn't happen. You know, but you're in a th- you're you're playing in a back three. You're supposed to get forward. You're supposed to be a creator. They're, you're supposed to provide width. He didn't, he, he may not have let much down the right hand side, but he also didn't create a lot down the right hand side. And the, the, the calamitous moment I think Derek picked up on it was when he actually run into Ryan Christie. I mean, he just didn't look like he wanted to be there. He, he knew Best what to do. in the game. Yeah. <laughs> he just didn't know what he, he needed to do. So, <laughs> uh, you know, um, yeah, we can all p- point the finger at, at, at Marshall for the goal and he, should be, he shouldn't be that far out of his box. But for me, you know, let's let's show a wee bit of balls. Let's get, let's get some of the young blood in. Let's, you know, th- this, this tournament, you know, let's be honest... Derek picked up on it again. If, if Sterling's going to be playing out in that left-hand side, it's not going to be pretty. It, it, you know, it's going to be like a car crash scene sometimes where you're just going to be continually holding your face going, don't look, don't look. Um, and, you know, would, would, would Patterson maybe provide a better option? Or I think purely for athleticism alone, you know, Patterson's quick, he's strong, you know, he, he's got he's got fear and youth on his side. Throw him in, throw Gilmore in, you know, take it to the gate. You need to take it to them a wee bit. And I think that's where 
you know, from from a Scotland point of view, we should really be looking at going, yeah. And plus, again, from a sorry that they continue on from purely from a selfish point of view, I don't want to see the Scottish game being bashed. I don't want to see Scotland going out and losing four or five nil, and everyone going, yeah, Scottish football shit. I want to see Scotland go and play well. You know, I want to see them putting up a fight. I want to see players who play in Scotland do well and then say, this is the guys that can compete. It's not all about the Premier League and their big money. But um, yeah, I would like to see, I would like to see the fact that Clark's defending O'Donnell from the get-go is, is a wee bit worrying for me. And, I'm, and hopefully he can, he can, can throw a wee, show a wee bit of gumption. Did, um, did Clark not in. inadvertently sort of step his foot in it there with that? I can't remember exactly what he said, but you know we're we're talking about a back five here. We're not talking about him being a right back. He he was yeah, yeah. he was questioned to be a right a wing back. Yeah. and a wing back in my mind goes forward. You look at the Holland. I know I know it's yeah, different yeah. thingy, but you look at the Dutch team. It's the same thing. Do you know what I mean? Their two wing backs are so far up the park that the. You know, they're pushing, they're, they're almost become two attackers. And when Scotland fell one behind the other day there with a the handing crowd behind them, that's the way that should have played out. Do you know what I mean? It should have been straight away, right, OK, O'Donnell, you've done your trip now, get off, get past and on, get a wee bit of balance on that right-hand side and go for them a wee bit and give the check something to think about either side. Because obviously Andy Robertson was playing, was playing well in the left. But mm. Gio would mention about having a wee bit of balls. So we're going to... I don't mean we're going to show our balls literally, but we're going to we're going we're, we're going to it's not that type of show. <laughs> no, no, we're going to put our team that we think should take the field in dark blue and Friday night, right? And Gio, before I actually just finalise my team, can we borrow Stephen Davis? Oh, absolutely! <laughs> Please, uh-huh. um, I'll give you mine first, right? And it'll be no shock after my my spiel and my rant and and. To say that John McLaughlin is my goalkeeper, right? <laughs> because I just I just believe in John and I believe that he's the man, right? Now, where I felt sorry if I can say that slightly for Clark is that he's big players let him down on Monday. Your McTominay's, your McGinn's, even Robertson was blood and thunder, but he has a chance to open the scoring. You've got to remain calm, keep composure, and stick the ball in the back of the net. He didn't do it. Um, so I'm going to go passing uh, right back. I'm going to back four. I'm going four three three. I'm doing Steven Gerrard stuff here, right? Because the blueprint is already fucking set. Just copy it, right? Steven uh, Steven Gerrard's side, right? Nathan Patterson. I'm going to put Grant Hanley in at centre half. Now I'm not sure why. I just don't know if there's just a, a lack of alternative there. Um, I'm going to go Kieran Tierney at, at left centre half, and I'm going to go Andy Robertson, obviously as the captain um, at left back. I'm going Billy Gilmore holding in midfield, dictating play. And ahead of him, I'm putting um, John McGinn, who I'm a huge fan of. I think he's a great player. He, he's poor on Monday, but he, he's, he is a good player. And Scott McTominay, I would like to see more advanced like he does for Man United. I feel as though we we ho- we hold Scott McTominay back a wee bit. When a big, powerful player like that, he burst into the box once on Monday and arguably should have won a penalty kick. Do you know what I mean? So to me, Scott McTominay should be a wee bit more advanced. James Forrest, I'm putting on the right-hand side. Fitness might be an issue there because of... Um, obviously, he's hard to play for Celtic this year, but I thought he looked lively when he came on, unlucky no to score. Um, and I've went... Ryan Fraser is another one whose fitness is... You know, he's not played a lot recently for Newcastle, but Ryan Fraser's pace and Forrest's pace on the other side I think would cause teams problems. If Fraser can't make it, then I've... I've Opted for Stuart Armstrong again. Don't think he was great in Monday. Has played well for Southampton to be fair to him. Um, and she Adams through the middle again. Pace. I believe pace is huge in football nowadays in modern day football. And Scotland slow the game down by playing Dykes up top. He said, so I agree with Callum completely. I was just playing devil's advocate there when he was going on about Dykes. But I, I just think pace is where we should go as as a Scotland team. Some would argue that possibly England's weakness is high balls and cross balls into the box. Maybe that's the case, but I'm sorry, Dykes hasn't done enough to start the game on Wednesday night, eh, Friday night. Derek, over to you, mate. It's pretty much the same team as you, Scott, and Lip, but I've went back three at uh, uh, Hanley, uh, Cooper and Tierney. Hopefully he's fit. Um, Patterson and Robertson is, is the wing-backs with Gilmore, McTominay, McGinn in the midfield, and I put in Forrest on this, but supporting Che Adams, I'd probably go up for Forrest, just because he's 
he, he likes to go over that right hand side, doesn't he, Mike? And that just beef up that right hand side a bit more, and, and he's got a bit of attacking now. So I would probably start him. He did well when he came on the other day there. So uh, and Che Adams up front for me, and that's how I would I would play it. Sorry, I'm taking Hanley out. I forgot all about Cooper. <laughs> I'm not a fan of Hanley. I just couldn't see the alternative. <laughs> Patrick, let's let's see your fl- flicky tacky football. Yeah, I'm, I'll keep with the five-three-two system just because even as much as you'd want it to change, I think there's no chance that during a tournament there would be a full systematic change. But I would start with. Despite I would, despite it's not going to happen, I would put McLaughlin in goals. Um, right wing back Patterson at right centre back. I would prefer McTominay. I think his dynamism is best as a centre back. I think he probably his long term future is best there. Um, he also can provide, given that t- Tierney's fit, a sort of dynamic of the overlapping centre backs that Sheffield United brought that was quite successful, so that they can provide some sort of um, direct ball from centre backs. Uh, then central centre back would be Cooper. Tyranny left centre back Robertson. Then the two central midfielders would be Gilmore and McGinn. And then the the sort of attacking midfielder I would like to see David Turnbull. And then it would be Nisbet and Adams up top. Uh, it's quite wholesale changes, but I think the nature of it is that you've got to test the players who have been on form, uh, those who will per- perhaps provide a spark. I think Nisbet and Turnbull both provide um, a creative angle and I think Nisbet's definitely better than Dykes. It does sort of take out the direct route that you can go with that Dykes provides, but I think Nisbet is a better finisher and uh, is quite good at linking up play. And he's whenever you watched Hibs, he was the man, much like Turnbull, who was the best Celtic player of the season. Despite a poor season, uh, he still performed really well. I would agree with that, by the way. And Turnbull, I would, if you're changing the formation I've put, I Turnbull would probably make it into that team as well. How he never got on when we're trying to unlock a defence on Monday, dude, fucking beat me, right? Callum, Patrick says about wholesale changes and stuff like that. Personally, I would change the manager, mate, but what about yourself? <laughs> Hi, Stephen Gerrard, if you fancy just staying up here in a couple of weeks, that's all right. Right, so I've, I've kind of gone with the same logic as, as Patrick in the sense of the formation. I, I don't see Clark waking up from this horrendous sleep that he seems to be in I've um, oh, I'm in I'm in trouble here I've gone with a bit of loyalty, I've kept Marshall in goal, do you know what my, my blue glasses are off, I think John McLaughlin is the better keeper but I it, it, I just don't see him starting against England I think Steve Clark's going to um, instill a bit of loyalty and probably hope that that'll inspire a good performance uh, the back line can either be a uh, a three or a five, depending on how much you want to lie to yourself. It's probably going to be a five of uh, Andy Robertson, Grant Hanley, Liam Cooper, um, Keaton Tierney and Nathan Parson. The midfield three stays the same for me. I can see that McTominay, um, the, I can see what you're saying about him dropping into the back instead, but I, I, do, I, I do like him in midfield. I think he is one of the highest quality players we have, and although he wasn't very good the last time, I've stuck with him. So John McGinn, Scott McTominay, and Billy Gilmore in the midfield, and the two up top, Shea Adams and Kevin Nisbet, and Lyndon Dykes. If this is the starting lineup, and this is the bench, this is Lyndon Dykes somewhere over here. Away from the... <laughs> Dykes and Jack Henry actually. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should try and get the U2 on on the show. I can ask questions. So what is it that makes you pish? See how you're (laughs) very good. Well, to be fair, with Matt Warburton on, we could ask to him about Lyndon Dykes, to be fair. Uh, What what are you you seeing in him now? (laughs) That's his plan B now, mate. (laughs) Apparently, I heard a rumour that he actually has Mark Warburton's nudes and he's... (laughs) (laughs) Gio, your team, your team, mate. Um, I know, obviously, coming from a Northern Ireland perspective. And by the way, the Green White Army missing from the tournament is to the tournament's <laughs> loss. Um, to be yeah, fair, because the fans alone would have been great to see and hear and the the, the joy that they bring. Um, don't get me wrong. Personally, I'm delighted because Stephen Davis gets a rest, but. That's just my Rangers glasses again, mate. Who would you who would you go with? Would you change formation? Would you change personnel? Would we phone Kenny Miller and ask him to come back just for one game? <laughs> well, Callum would be my manager straight off. 
Yeah, I'm just going to make him manager. Just, for, just, just in case it does happen that. in the future, I'll, I'll spoil that I would play the 4-4-1 Kenny. Okay. That's what I'd be playing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would probably, I, I like, I like the, I like Patrick's and I like Derek's. For me personally, you know, I, I love. No, sorry, I have to use that word very loosely. I like the way Tierney plays in that Arsenal back three. He almost, almost plays as a bit of a wing back himself. So I would like to see Marshall will probably be at the in Nets. Tierney on the left, Cooper and McTominay. Um, Patterson right wing back, Robertson left wing back. I would like to see Turnbull in there. I think he deserves a shot uh, with old Gilmore and John McGinn. And Shea Adams and probably a bit of Kevin Nesbitt up front. If, if he's not going to show the faith in Kevin Nesbitt, then maybe even a, the likes of a James Forrest in behind him. Um, that sort of thing, you know, that wee bit of pace. And I think... I think it, we, you probably need to take the game to England because let's be honest, they're pretty potent going forward themselves. And they, their only real weakness, if we're being totally honest, John Stones and Terrell Mings at the back. So, you know, maybe stick the two up front, go go man on man on them and, and, and let the midfield runners from Turnbull them again come through on them. That just about kind of wraps it up. Um, we've put the world to right. We've, we've selected our Scotland squad that's going to defeat England um, at Wembley on Friday night. <laughs> um, I dread to think Steve Clark's squad. I dread to think what will happen if, if Steve Clark goes with what he seems to be doing. Um, I think we could be in for a, a nasty uh, night. Um, but my thanks to Derek, Geo, Patrick and Callum for joining us in episode 2 of the Euro Review. It's been good fun. It's great to have football to watch. Um, hopefully it continues and whether we have Scotland in there or no, Callum, I think. <laughs> 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 At least we've got football, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> um, so, hi, tonight, Scotland, England, Wembley. Can't be that bad, can it? 